Hello, I'm Barry Worrell and I'm here to talk about the United Kingdom's family law regime. I thought I'd introduce myself briefly and uh, give an indication of what we can talk about later on. My career was as a software engineer. Uh, I made software for eight years, including with the British computer company ICL, which was the equivalent of IBM uh, in those days. And I moved on to become a lecturer in software engineering at the second university in Newcastle, uh, which is called Northumbria. I was there for 26 years and I'm now retired. Now my background in family law uh, started with my own case uh, in 1990 and went on for a few years. Um, I subsequently or soon after uh, joined Families Need Fathers, which is a British uh, father's support group essentially to do with support rather than campaigning. And because I'd applied to the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, I was elected onto their National Council. So I was on their National Council for five years. And for two of those five years, I was the editor of their quarterly magazine. Um, around about the mid nineties, I became disillusioned with Families and Fathers and I joined the then United Kingdom men's movement. Um, and subsequently uh, met a chap called Dr. John Campion, who organized one of the uh, first intergroup meetings um, in about 1996 or thereabouts. And uh, we met in Whitney in Oxfordshire and moved on to Cheltenham. So we called ourselves the Cheltenham Group uh, after that, and that name is still used for certain purposes. Um, in 1995 or thereabouts, we surveyed members of Families Need Fathers. The, the, the then 1500 members all received an eight page uh, survey and that was returned to us. And there was an analysis of this, this survey. Um, and the following year, 1996, this 330 page report was produced. Um, it includes information that has never been uh, collected by the government or by the Lord Chancellor's Department. It uh, has a statistical analysis of the process and outcomes of family law and lots and lots of um, anecdotal information. I'd like to read one uh, chap's statement that he, he made. He said, my wife used me to have a baby and be supported, then left me ruined by lying. Um, I also organised the local meetings here in Newcastle and local fathers would turn up and tell their stories and try to get advice uh, what to do in their diff often difficult situations. And that went on for, for several years. Um, I subsequently, in the early 2000s, decided to write my own book. Um, that's it there without authority. It's available on Amazon as a paperback um, and, and as a Kindle version. Um, this report, which is titled The Emperor's New Clothes, was actually taken to the government. Um, Dr. John Campion and myself met a chap called Jeff Hoon, who uh, was then a junior minister in the Lord Chancellor's Department. He completely dismissed this report. He, flipped, he was flipping through it like this and completely ignored it uh, without, even re without even reading it. That's sort of, that's an indication of the sort of thing we're up against uh, in trying to get things sorted out here in the UK. In this age of equality, or when uh, so many people demand equality, particularly feminists, of course, uh, you might think that there was equality in family law. This simply isn't the case in the United Kingdom. Um, if a man contests residence, what used to be called custody of his children after separation and divorce, the figures for a number of years were that he had a 10% chance of gaining that residence of his own children. Uh, the excuses used that because the 
mother has residence of the children, she needs money to provide for those children. And therefore there's a big disparity in the split of assets after separation and divorce where children are concerned. If the woman remarries, um, gets a new husband, then whatever income they have, they also have money coming in from the father. This didn't apply before, therefore the woman has more money coming in after separation and divorce with children. Um, further, it's quite possible for a woman to take children a distance in the country and even overseas. And this is not prohibited at all. I personally know a man whose children were taken to South Africa. He never saw them again. I know someone else, or Brian, whose daughter was taken to Oslo. Uh, he, he tried to keep in touch, but he lost contact. Simply impractical to keep in touch at those distances. Until recently, the government gave what's called legal aid for family law cases. Um, and if, if you have an income, you're not eligible for legal aid. If you have no income, which applied more, more often to, to women and mothers, then you are more likely to get the legal aid. So there was this disparity there. The government were actually helping uh, the breakdown of families uh, by offering that legal aid. Let's look at work and earnings, particularly pensions. Until about 1998, uh, if a man earned a pension, married man earned a pension, with a separation and divorce, he would keep that pension and enjoy it later on in his life. However, in the, in the late 90s, a group of women got together under the banner of, of the title of Fair Shares and uh, got some letterhead, lobbied the government and demanded that pensions should be shared pro rata to the time that the couple were together. Well, within a year or two of their campaign, the law was changed to bring in what is called pension splitting. So now a man's pension can be split, as I say, pro rata to the number of years they were together. And if the woman didn't earn an, at all, want an easy life as a housewife or whatever, or just an easier job, she, would, she could claim a share of her ex-husband's pension. The arguments used that the wife had helped her husband earn his pension during the time that they were together. Strange that if he hadn't met her and married her, he would have performed his work himself and earn the pension all by himself without any assistance at all. So this is just another example of the, the bent logic that's used in family law. So we've got a situation in the UK in which a woman can discard her husband and her marriage, but keep a lot of the very significant benefits of the marriage. She can even behave badly and keep these benefits. These benefits are the children she wanted, income to provide for those children, a share of the man's uh, life savings, and even of his future income and his pension. So a lot of the benefits of the marriage do continue for women, but this is simply isn't the case for men. Judges have enormous discretion in family law. Uh, to give one example of this, uh, children's issues are dealt with by the Children Act 1989. Uh, this act emphasize, emphasizes the child's best interests principle. Uh, that is that the decisions that are taken should always bear in mind the child's best interest. Whichever order you apply for to court, and there are four orders, they are residence where the child lives, a contact who gets to see the child as well, and a couple of others, including specific issues. So whichever order you apply for, the judge can award any other order he, see, he or she sees fit here. 
Because the child's best interest takes precedent, the concept of justice between the parents is, is almost irrelevant because it's purely what is in the child's best interest and whatever justice or injustice might come out of the decisions taken, that is irrelevant as far as the Children Act is concerned. Um, the criteria for deciding what's in the child's best interest is, is not objective at all. It's just someone's opinion. With regard to feedback about the effectiveness of the family law courts, uh, there's very little, if any, uh, feedback to the courts or government about just how successful they are. Um, the courts might get a, some feedback if someone returns to court and challenges a previous decision. But if you take things like how the children progress subsequently, how are the fam family managed with work and finances, and how uh, the, the view that's taken of the justice that the parties have obtained in the family law courts, there's almost, almost not, none. Uh, the government have a national statistics uh, department, but uh, it doesn't get down to that level of detail. If we take um, the Cheltenham Group's report, the Emperor's New Clothes, here are some bar charts uh, which show, in one case, the legal costs of proceedings for men and of the divorce for both parties. Another bar chart covers the financial impact um, to the family. That's a level of detail the government simply doesn't have and the court simply doesn't have. I think it's very important that people understand what the rules are regarding marriage. I mean, getting married and founding a family and having a home and a career is an enormous investment in this area. And therefore, it's very important that you should know what the, what the rules are and what the outcomes might be if things go wrong. I'd like to give an analogy. We've got a system of mortgages in the UK where it's possible to buy uh, one or two people can buy, borrow from a, um, a bank or building society and buy a home. Everyone know, knows what the rules are. You borrow the money, the bank lends the money, you pay interest on that and you pay the capital back either in stages or as a lump sum with an endowment policy or whatever. If something goes wrong, you know what the rules are. Unfortunately, the bank can reclaim the house and get the money back if you default on your payments and so on. But at least you know what the rules are. It's not possible, what hasn't happened in my lifetime anyway, that, that someone can come along, a third party, not yourself, not the bank or building society, but a third party, even the government or whatever, can come along and simply change the rules. That's never been done. And, and if it was where to be done, people would be in, uh, in uproar about it. You know, you need to have some surety about these things and know what the outcome is going to be, know what the rules are. Unfortunately, uh, the rules can be changed with regard to marriage and the family. In fact, the government regularly has modifications made to these things, uh, originating from different sources. We'll come on to that a bit later on. Um, and those people who are currently married are rarely consulted. In fact, in many cases, they're not even informed. So people who made the commitment to marriage years ago can find that the rules that they maybe thought or thought they knew um, would apply are changed unilaterally by somebody else. Um, as, as one example of that, uh, just this, this year, 2020, um, the government have relaxed the rules on um, divorce in the sense that you don't have to make any allegations about the behavior of the other party at all. So it's simply a divorce on request. So everyone currently married has suddenly had the rules changed. Not only were they not consulted, they weren't even informed. As one example of this, 
um, the, the pension splitting rules that were changed around about 1998. Those people who were currently were, were married at that time suddenly found that in the case of separation and divorce, the pension could be split. They weren't asked about this. They weren't asked to approve this change or anything. Um, it's interesting that uh, at this very moment in the UK, we have some campaigning women who go under the name of WASPI, Women Against State Pension Inequality. Now, what's happening at the present time, the UK government are changing the rules um, about the UK state pension. And women's pension, pension age has been increased to be in line with men. They've, for many, many years, had their pensions at 60, well, while men had to wait to 65. So these women uh, object to the, the raising of their pension age. They've got to wait until the same, same year as men to get their pension. But they are using the excuse that they weren't informed in time. No one told them enough time ago to start saving for their pensions. And so they're using the fact that they weren't informed as a major plank of their argument to have some sort of preferential treatment here. Funnily enough, the very same women didn't object to the pension study, which would mainly benefit women. Strange that, isn't it? So it is important that everyone understands what they're getting into if they get married and have children. Um, and it's also important, as we've heard, that the, the rules regarding this cannot be changed. But they should also know what the rules are from the start. So I propose that we introduce into this national school curriculum uh, knowledge about family law, how it operates, how you use the law as well, so that those getting into trouble in the family know what the outcomes are going to be and are not shocked by the outcomes at all. They should know from the start what they're getting into and those rules regarding this should not be capable of being changed by anyone during the marriage. Uh, it's interesting that uh, my, my own son, who was married just a few years ago, um, in, in idle conversation, I mentioned pension splitting to him, and he simply had no idea that this was the case. So there's a concrete example of um, a, a young man, well, he's in his 30s, um, getting married without actually knowing what the rules are. So introducing the law, law knowledge of uh, the family, and uh, marriage laws and so on and how to use the law is a very important component of the school curriculum and should be introduced. In a democracy, most people should be involved in forming the laws that govern their lives, particularly those laws that cover major components of their lives. I mean, if you take things like the laws on theft or murder or something like that, well, that affects very limited numbers of people, very, very few, very small proportion of the population. But if you take family law, this affects the majority of the population, and therefore the majority of the people involved should have a say in what goes on. Uh, now, the Cheltenham Group have made submissions to the various uh, government reform proposals that uh, have gone on and if you do this you receive a copy of the report at the end and your name is listed in an appendix at the end and you can see who else has submitted. It is amazing how many feminist groups are listed in, in those appendices. But in the end the laws are formed by a limited number of people so we need to look at who those people are and understand their motives. If we think that in a democracy, the majority of people should be involved in those laws, in the form and formation of those laws that affect the majority of their lives, we should be very concerned if judges are involved in lawmaking. After all, if judges are significantly involved in lawmaking, they're then in a position where they make the law and they enforce the law as well. 
So they're dictators. Um, there is a, um, a lady who was called Dame Brenda Hale. There is a newspaper cutting of her as she resigns from the Supreme Court. She was, until earlier this year, President of the Supreme Court, arguably the highest level of judge in the United Kingdom. Um, she had previously been an academic, I think in law. She wrote a paper back in the 1990s called Ends and Means. And this paper you can read on the Cheltenham Group website. Just search for Ends and Means. Um, the paper is effectively a feminist manifesto regarding the family. It ends up by questioning whether marriage continues to serve any useful purposes. So obviously a feminist dream has been to destroy the family, what used to be called the nuclear family. Um, if you look online, you can find some of the activities of judges. Here is the Supreme Court website, an extract from the Supreme Court website. It lists uh, a number of speeches that the senior judges have made, including Dame Brenda Hale. Uh, in fact, you can even download the, the, the speeches that she, she has made. Uh, it's worth looking at human rights laws. And of course, the UK is a signatory to the European Convention on Human Rights that's administered by the uh, Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. Um, one of the uh, protocols in the Human Rights Convention states that people have the right to marry and to found a family. Unfortunately, it doesn't say what marriage actually means, what that actually means. After all, it is possible to just live with someone or not even live with someone and have children with them, cohabit. So if in the human rights laws, it states that you have the right to marry, which presumably gives not just rights, but obligations and responsibilities as well, but it doesn't say what that actually means. It doesn't, doesn't distinguish marriage from cohabitation. And therefore the human rights laws are inadequate to the situation as well. It's worth bearing that in mind. So to summarize, here in the UK, we've got a system of family law in which ordinary people are rarely consulted when it comes to developing that law. Um, those groups of agendas are very significantly involved in formulating new law. And the senior judges are also significantly involved, putting themselves in a dictatorial position. I have to say that men are relatively unrepresented and that needs to change. Perhaps what we ought to have is a, an institute or a government department that looks at this whole area and ensures that uh, ordinary people are consulted very much, that they're informed about changes to the law that affects them and their permission is sought, and also that um, young people are educated in line with this area of their lives to prepare them for their adult life by changing the national curriculum to include this, this area and significant parts of this, this area. That's my proposal anyway. I'll try to keep this talk as uh, brief and succinct as I possibly can. Um, I think I've covered the main points that should be considered about family law at this point in time in, in the UK. But I thought I'd add a kind of appendix um, to, to this um, by quoting from this report from the late 1990s. Now, I know that's uh, more than 20 years ago, but nevertheless, I think it's important that the story is told. Um, the report has a preface and a foreword. The preface is written by Dr. John Campion, and this is what he said. This book is about re what really happens in divorce. As I write this preface, I have on my desk a newspaper cutting from the Times 
of the 31st of August 1996. It describes how a popular teacher of 44 killed himself because he could not cope with his wife having taken his four children, aged between five and ten, to go and live with a work colleague, her lover. The coroner's verdict was, quote, quite clearly his life fell apart because, after seven years of happy marriage, his wife formed a close relationship with a work colleague. As an aside, I'd like to say that um, the coroner was wrong on this. His life, his life, the euphemism, his life fell apart, is preposterous. The fact is the law system in this country, in the UK, did not protect this man. Right. The preface continues. In truth, why this distressed man's life court fell apart and that of his children was because this selfish and uncaring woman was fully supported by a corrupt legal process in what she was doing. The husband faced nothing but a life of grief and anguish seeing some strange man bringing up his children, while he probably at the same time faced the loss of his home and most of his life savings, and would also be faced with the CSA, that's Child Support Agency, demand of several hundreds of pounds a month to pay into this quote reconstituted family. He would have no hope of restarting a family life and had little to live for. His wife is morally no better than a murderess and the lawyer supporting her no better than accessories to this contemptible act. An isolated incident you might think, a strange and accidental occurrence that hardly ever happens you might think. If you do think this, you might be forgiven because you, like the rest of the population, have been subjected to stream after stream of false argument, distorted logic and misinformation that has been spawned by the divorce law reformers, that is the Law Commission, that's a body in the UK. They are tame academics and the social work and legal professionals over the past three decades. Why this has happened is that in 1965 the Law Commission was set up to quote advise the Lord Chancellor on law reform. This body has powerful links with practicing legal and social work professionals, university legal departments, research funding bodies and most importantly the Lord Chancellor's office. The full implications of this have hardly been recognised even by the government, who, as we have seen in the passage of the Family Law Bill, have, have been reduced to little more than mouthpieces for their rhetoric. Neither are the implications recognised by Parliament or the public. The control of family law has been effectively handed over lock, stock and barrel to a tiny but very influential group of individuals underpinned by an intellectual culture which is libertarian and feminist in its value system. That is underpinned by values that are laissez-faire with regard to social conduct and are anti-family and anti-men. It is therefore hardly surprising that in the course of the three decades of the Law Commission's existence the divorce courts have abandoned any consideration of matrimonial obligations in their dealings and have opted for divorce on unilateral demand coupled with custody settlements based on biology, i.e. automatically in the mother's favour and financial settlements based purely on the court needs of the new family unit. This is the only legitimate family unit now recognised by the state it is not the married unit of father, mother and children united by a permanent commitment to fidelity but the mother and her children and whoever she cares to live with from time to time. The father who may be excluded at the whim of the mother and the agencies of the state has been reduced to no more than an economic provider. The UK is re renowned as the divorce capital of Europe, having the highest divorce rate, rate rising 50% over the last 
of any other European country. In the USA at the present time, 30% of children do not live with their natural fathers, and this is set to rise to 50% by the turn of the century. The government and the law reformers wash their hands of the matter, claiming that the causes lie, quote, deep in the fabric of society, and that all the law does is to cope with an, an unhappy but inevitable state of affairs. This is a, a quite untenable position. It is blatantly obvious to anyone, having the slightest knowledge of what goes on in divorce, that the law is the most powerful of motivators of marriage breakdown. And this book provides evidence of this. At the time of writing this book, the Family Law Act 1996 has recently been passed with the full support of Parliament and the churches, despite the fact that this Act consolidates and formally recognises these destructive practices which serve to abolish marriage in all but name. This abolition provides the main engine to what is fast becoming the state-engineered matrilineal society. During our campaigning against the Family Law Bill, we became shocked at the appalling degree of ignorance that exists regarding the impact of the law of families, and in particular on fathers and on their children. This book is a brave and noble attempt to remedy this ignorance. In the fairy tale, The Emperor's New Clothes, the populace were conned into believing as if what was patently absurd and false was in fact true. They, were, they all followed like sheep, not having the guts to stand up and declare that the Emperor had no clothes on at all. It took a young child, who was too young and naive to be corrupted, to tell it as it was, that, quote, the Emperor had no clothes on at all. So it will be with divorce law. It just needs for some influential person, a politician or church leader, to have the guts to stand up and declare that what is going on in the divorce courts is an abomination against humanity and must be stopped. If this can only happen, I am convinced that, on looking back, people will be as shocked about what is going on as we were about burning witches and as puzzled as to how this could possibly come about. This book is unique in that it does not retreat into distanced abstraction. It very much tells it as it is. It is based on the detail of the real corruption and human misery that lies behind the acceptable face of rhetoric created by the reformers and demonstrates shockingly that the Times case mentioned at the beginning is not an isolated incident, but represents merely the tip of an iceberg of squalid corruption and suffering that is relentlessly destroying individual lives and eating away at the fabric of society. I urge you to read it and then act. John Campion, Midhurst, 17th of September, 1996. It's worth saying that uh, the vast majority of people haven't been told these stories that um, this report has uh, published um, because the media in the UK are so heavily biased. They've been taken over by, quite deliberately I'm sure, uh, by those with agendas. Let's just say that they're not man friendly. Uh, the BBC is my circle of friends, isn't the British Broadcasting Corporation, it's the biased Broadcasting Corporation. Let me quote from the forward of this report now. It's written by a chap called Norman Dennis, who was a researcher in various institutions, universities, um, uh, in social science. Um, by chance, when he wrote this report, he was at one of the universities in Newcastle, where I, where I, where I live. Um, that's, just, that's just pure chance. Right, the forward. The new report from the Cheltenham Group, an association fighting for the family, in the old sense of the term, 
does two things. First, it gives chapter and verse to the precise mechanisms through which the legal system itself has been willfully and consciously used to destroy the institution of marriage against the clear letter of the law and Parliament's stated intentions. It does so in a way that gives everyone the chance to check through their local library whether the Cheltenham group is right or not in its facts and interpretations. Only with last year's Family Law Act was marriage, marriage ab abandoned as a lifelong commitment that could be terminated only if the innocent party consented to the termination in the event of serious mis misconduct of the guilty party. But the report shows with incontrovertible evidence that for 20 years before and more, men had been the victims of a court system that increasingly acted on what can ever only be a legal fiction, that in marriage breakdown, neither party could be caught at fault, brackets, or both parties were always equally at fault, and therefore the law would only act on the assumption of, quote, no fault. The principle and terminology were both lifted straight out of motor car insurance. The sole idea in both fields is to save everybody, everybody except the innocent party, argument, trouble and expense. Secondly, it documents a series of case studies. By the nature of things, the individual reader cannot check on the harrowing stories the father's report in convincing detail. We hear only their version and their side. But from what they say, one thing is quite certain. If to be a conscientious and committed husband and father was today even vaguely politically correct, both parts of the report would be at the top of every, quote, fearless fearless campaign journalists list of truly sensational scandals of the second half of the 20th century to be exposed, of manipulating professionals to be brought to book, and of widespread and deep-seated individual tragedies, many of them too late now to be corrected, to be at least and at last recognised for the shameful injustices they were and remain. Norman Dennis, 15th of February 1997, formerly reader in social studies, guest fellow in the Department of Religious Studies, University of Newcastle upon Tyne. Finally, just to say, thank you very much for watching.